Well, I'm going to be preaching on worship today. Amen. Good. There's somebody. All right. Woo. That's how I wanted to be in here in this place this morning. You know, saying amen to a preacher is like saying sick him to a dog, okay? So you, you can't miss. You can't distract me. It's okay if you talk back to me. If we were down at Gillette Stadium and, and we were, you know, the Patriots just scored a touchdown, I'd be like bumping you, punching you, yelling at you, and you'd be yelling at me and be all happy and good. Well, let's just have church this morning, all right? I'm going to deep southern fried, Kentucky fried preaching. Is that okay? It's going to be a little different today. But I'm preaching about worship, and worship was such a powerful thing in my life when I first got born again. I didn't know any different. I mean, I would praise the Lord wherever, whenever, however. And as I typically am, I'm very loud. So if you're anywhere within earshot, you're going to hear those praises. And I remember one time being parked in front of my mom's office. She was a certified public accountant, high-profile office, people in suits and stuff walking out. Man, and just being parked in my Chevette in the front spot, just giving a Joe Cocker-type praise. You know what I'm saying? Just, just praising God, singing I exalt thee at the top of my lungs, not even giving a rip about what people were thinking because the grace of God had touched my life and changed my life. And so I understand from the very early times of being a Christian that praise and worship is a powerful thing. How many of you all know what I'm talking about? But I can tell you there's warfare over your praise and worship this morning. Do you hear me? There's warfare over your praise and worship. So praise and worship can be a double-edged sword. What are you doing? I'm fighting off the devil. What do you think's going on? Relax, relax. I am too fighting off the enemy. <laughs> Say, so, how goes the battle, brother? I mean, uh, sister? Good, good. How about you? Well, 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 yes. <sighs> Uh. So. What are you saying to me? I'm fighting off the enemy. Duh. Oh, okay. So, say. <clears throat> I haven't really seen you around these parts before. Uh, do you go to a local church or something? Yeah. No, I go to Riverside Pentecostal. It's the only cutting edge church around, and the worship is lit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <clears throat> a charismaniac, I see. I, myself, am a Lutheran. <laughs> a Lutheran? I didn't know you guys even knew there was an enemy. And where did you hear such a thing as that? Everybody knows you stiffs or know nothing about warfare. <clears throat> of course. Leave it to a Pentecostal to think that they know everything about God. Oh, watch out! Ha, 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 ha. Well, listen. Lutherans don't speak in tongues. Your music is boring. Our music <clears throat> has culture. Maybe you should adhere to some tradition yourself instead of picking up every wind of doctrine that comes around. What is it this week? Barking in the spirit? Hipster worship? Listen, pal, at least we believe in the full gospel. You just ignore the parts of the Bible you don't understand. We choose to be seeker sensitive. Yeah, and your services are like funerals. Yeah, and yours are all out of order. I mean, it's a miracle you even have visitors. We're soul winners, not soul whiners. Soul winners? Mm -hmm. How do you get that? We bust them off the streets. How do you win the locks? We relate through the arts. <laughs> Christian theater? There's no such thing. You cultured on swine? Oh? Yeah. Well, you don't raise <laughs> your hands in worship, and <laughs> you don't pray for healing, <laughs> and you drink too much communion. Oh, yeah? Well, you think you know it all, and you're always doing kooky things. Yeah, well, look who's <laughs> kooky now, you stuck-up know-it-all. Listen, listen. Watch behind you. Listen, that's the oldest trick no, in the book, listen and I to ain't me. that listen stupid. To me. No. <laughs> My God. My God. What have we done? Come on, give him a hand this morning. Yeah. 
Worship is a powerful weapon. And I know all of us think like, my church does it right, and no one else is doing it right. If we'd stop fighting over worship and our preferences, because that's the place when the devil gets in and kills us, that's just what happened on that stage, maybe we could be a powerful weapon in God's hands. Amen? Are you out there? Say amen. So today's message is entitled Overcome. I believe that as we worship God and we praise God wherever we go, that we can be an overcomer. Who wants to be an overcomer this morning? I do. I definitely do. Here's the thing I've seen over the years of being a pastor, that a lot of people experience the presence of God in church, but then they have trouble carrying it home. The minute they cross the threshold of the church doors, there's warfare. The minute they get into the parking lot, there's problems. When they break the threshold of the door of their home, there's trouble. And I wonder if we really know what it is to take what happens in this place to our home. I want to tell you a story in the Bible about David. King David was bringing back the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, which represented the presence of God. He wanted to bring it to its home. He wanted to give the Ark of the Covenant a home. To that time, it had been traveling in the traveling tabernacle, which was like a traveling temple where they would uh, have worship and offer sacrifice in a tent with courts. And so as Jerusalem became King David's and Israel's, he wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant, which represented the presence of God, back to its home, to its resting place. The only problem is that David did this in an unwise fashion. He didn't follow what the Bible said, the Old Testament said, about carrying the ark. And so as they carried the ark in an unwise fashion, it began to shake and get unsteadied. And a man named Uzzah reached out to study the ark. And when he touched the ark, God struck him dead. And David was upset and confused about why God would strike Uzzah dead. All he was doing is trying to take care of the ark. It speaks to us today that if we're going to carry the presence of God from the church and from a worship setting into our home, we have to do it in a wise way. Amen? We have to be wise with the presence of God. We have to be good stewards of the presence of God. David did this and he went back to the Bible and looked in the Old Testament on the instructions of how to carry the ark, which represented the presence of God, in any fashion. He tried to do it exactly right. And the Bible says that he sacrificed every six steps when they carried the ark back to Jerusalem after this. But in between him finding out how he should really carry it and him actually transporting the presence of God, the ark of God to Jerusalem, it stopped at somebody's house. Somebody took the ark in and it was welcomed. To that point, people had captured the ark and God wiped out people, gave them boils and cancers and stuff and wiped them out. But this particular gentleman received the presence of God and the ark of God in such a way where he was blessed. So look at 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse 11. Thus the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obadiah, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Listen, God's presence is not in a box. God's presence is not in a building. It's funny how men and women look at the world differently, right? How many of you have ever heard this description of men and women? Men are like waffles. And women are like a bowl of spaghetti. How many of y'all have ever heard this? All right, four of you. This is deeply spiritual. This is doctrine that you need to have in your life, okay? Remember this. Women are like spaghetti in the sense that if her husband says something kind and is very dear to her during the morning, let's say, there's no compartmentalizing. It affects the rest of the day. So hence the noodles all stirred up inside of the bowl. That's what makes women more intuitive and better relationally because they're in touch with things that are going on, right? Guys, on the other hand, are like those waffles. I don't know what your waffles look like, but my waffles have all kinds of compartments. I thought guys would say amen right there. Anyway, we're talking about food, guys. Come on. 
And so we often compartmentalize something. If something bad happens between our wife and I in the morning, we can walk out the door, shut the door, and we're completely fine. And David wanted to bring the, the presence of God into Jerusalem. He didn't want it to be compartmentalized. And can I tell you, we can't compartmentalize the presence of God so that it's just here in this hour and a half. We need to be a little bit more like the woman folk. When something happens right here with the presence of God, we need to carry it out and it needs to affect every part of our day. Every, every relationship we're in, it needs to affect. Amen? We need to be a little bit more like a bowl of spaghetti and allow that presence of God to go out with us. Obed-Edom wanted the presence of God and the Bible says that his sons were raised up as mighty men of valor because he had the presence of God in his life. Yesterday, you know, I've had a little problem with my nasal passages and my sinuses. Yesterday I was feeling really good, so man, I was like singing at the top of my lungs yesterday. And somebody in the church called Patty and Patty was like two rooms over. And I'm like, ah! And I heard her say, oh, that's just Chad, he's praising the Lord. Can I tell you something? Something powerful happens in your life and in the atmosphere of your home when you let loose the praises of God and you worship God in your house. It will make a difference. It will shift the atmosphere. You see, you need to be a rainmaker in your house. What do you mean by that? Look at this verse in Zechariah. I thought this was awesome. Zechariah 14, 17 says this, and it will be that whichever of the families of the earth does not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. You see, when enough condensation and enough moisture gathers in the atmosphere, it gets heavy enough, and then it rains on us. I believe in your home that if enough praise gathers in the atmosphere, that the glory of God will come raining down, that the grace of God, that the presence of God will come raining down, and you need it in that home that may be dry, spiritually dry, may be a desert. You need to send the praises up so that they, they make a condensation of the glory of God, and it comes down on your house this morning. Here's my encouragement to you today. Sing for the king. Sing for the king. Psalm 156 says this, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. It's time to get your praise on. Wherever you're at. I don't care if you're at Wally World or you're at church or you're at school or you're at your job. Get your praise on. Get your praise on. I mean, it's time to get your praise on. Amen. Psalm 134, 2 says this, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Every one of your hands have a finger on it. And every one of your fingers has a fingerprint, which speaks to the individuality of each one of us. When we raise up our hands in the sanctuary, when we raise up our hands to God, it's speaking of the individual worship that God wants from you. He wants your praise, not a church's praise. He wants individuals praising him, loving on him, and he will love them back. Praise changes the atmosphere. There's such thing as a shout of praise, which if you're a guest today, I've been shouting and loud the whole time, so you're like, okay, I get it. But it's actually scriptural. Psalm 47, 1 says this, clap your hands, all you people, and shout to God with a voice of joy. The old commercial for the laundry detergent told us that we needed to shout out the stains, right? Shout it out. Who remembers that? you got to be probably at least 40 to remember this. Kids, just take my word for it. It used to be a commercial, all right? Some things in your life, you, can, you have to shout out. You can't bury it. You can't resolve it inside of yourself. You can't absolve it. You've got to shout it out. And when you shout it out, man, something changes. So many times in the Old Testament, they shouted to, to win the war. They shouted to see the walls crumble. They shouted to win over some enemy. 
You need to have a shout in your life. That's right. You get up in the morning like nothing's going good. It's like glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Your kids might think you're out of, out of your mind, but the presence of God will break what it, what's ever in that place. Amen? It changes the atmosphere. Psalm 150 and verse 3 says this, Praise him with the trumpet sounds. Praise him with the harp and lyre. David was a warrior, but he was a worshiper first, people. When he was out taking care of those sheep, and he defeated the lion and the bear. I believe he was out there singing. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I believe he was out there reciting those songs that have found themselves in the book. The Bible. He was out there praising God. And God gave him the victories over the lion and the bear. You know in Psalm 153 it talks about the trumpet. There's just something about the trumpet in me. When someone blows a trumpet and someone's really good at blowing a trumpet and they play something, dude, I, I want to run right through a wall. I really do. I tried that once. Somebody tried to copy me, copy me and run through the wall with me and they got really hurt. Another story for another time. I love the trumpet sound. I remember being in the second row at Liberty University, and I love Phil Driscoll. Phil Driscoll was considered the greatest trumpet player in the world at one season in his life, and he got saved out of a cocaine habit and became this, this mighty horn for God. And I used to listen to all of his music. I still do, actually. And I was sitting on this second row, and all my Baptist brothers, God bless them, they all sang in a quartet. They hated his singing. I exalt. You know, he's just... Sounded like he was a chain smoker his entire life. But I loved it. Had a lot of soul in it. He's up there playing the trumpet. He always dressed down. He had a Hugo Boss suit, which is a style of suit from a long time ago. And Jerry Falwell, chancellor of the school, great. Great Christian man's in the front row with his trumpet player from his leading, from his leading band at the school. This guy could play the trumpet, man. He played some of Phil's songs. Phil got up there. And all my friends, man, they just, ah, oh, I can't stand that singing. They started to melt under the anointing of God. That, that guy can make that trumpet talk. He was up there playing, man. I was like, I was just watching him. Falwell's in the front row punching his drummer or his trumpeter, just saying, oh, my goodness. I think he came with a mindset to not prove something, but to show the anointing of God. I remember one time he took his mouthpiece, and he started playing a song with his, just his mouthpiece, spits coming out of the, I mean, just playing with it, just his mouthpiece. He did this horse sound, all this crazy stuff. I said, this guy's insane. He hit this crazy note with just his mouthpiece, and then he stuck the trumpet on the end of his mouthpiece, and it was the same note. I'm like, this guy's just nuts. <laughs> he didn't hit quite as low a note as that, but it was close. I was almost dead. Thank you, God. Reliving this moment. You can be like that trumpet in your house. You can change the atmosphere. 1 Samuel 16, 23 says this, and this is David, as an armor bearer to Saul. So it came about whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul. David would take his harp and play it with his hand. And Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. Folks, there might be some funky spirits are trying to crawl up into your house and into your family and into your kids' lives. Listen, a child going out into the world today, buddy, you better have supernatural protection. You better have the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You better have praise and worship as your sword and your spear. But I'm telling you something, when you lift up praise, to God in your house, those funky spirits have to get lost. It's time to lift up praise and worship in our houses. You see, the greater your private worship, the greater your public effect. And the people that you want to affect the most need to hear you praise the Lord. Dads, listen to me. The emotional detachment from children is one of the biggest plights in New England. Fathers not being emotionally attached to the children. That's a huge problem. 
It's the reason we have so much dysfunction in New England. Can I tell the truth this morning? You know, your kids need to see you emotionally interact with something. Hopefully your wife, hopefully them, but there's just something powerful when they see you emotionally interact with your God. When they see tears going down your face because God's spirit broke your heart. There's no greater gift you can give your children than that. Any funky spirits will be gone. Dad, that's your place. That's your place. God has reserved it for you. Praise will also position you for victory. I've said this many times in the church. I just want to make sure I'm in the right place this morning. How many of y'all would rather be victorious than be defeated? Raise your hand. How many of you guys would rather win than lose? The rest of you that haven't raised your hand, you're just way too spiritual for us. Who would rather lose? Not gonna raise my hand. You see, praise will position you for victory. Gideon, remember the story of Gideon in the book of Judges? Gideon is hiding in the wine press trampling out grapes in the wine press, hiding from Midian. And God visits him and tells him this. In verse 14, And the Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, Gideon said to the Lord, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I am the youngest, the smallest, the weakest in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat Midian as one man. Gideon accomplishes the impossible. And God instructs him after this experience in the wine press, he instructs him to go down and listen to the Midians. I love this. I absolutely love this. So Gideon goes down, he sneaks close to the camp in the Midian, Midianites, and he's within earshot of two guys talking. You read this in the Bible? This is funny. And God gives this Midianite a nightmare. Can I tell you right now? We shouldn't be the ones that are intimidated in this world. Man, we're so scared to speak of Jesus. It's the enemy that should be having nightmares, not the children of God. Are you out there this morning? Say amen. So, Here's Gideon with an earshot of these two Midianites, and I love this, man, it's like a typical dream. I don't know if you have strange dreams, but this is a funny one. So Gideon is there, he's listening, and this guy recites the dream, and he says this, a great big loaf of bread came rolling into our camp and ran over some tents. Surely it is the sword of the Lord through Gideon. I love this. The enemy should be intimidated. The enemy should be having nightmares about what the children of God who arm themselves with praise are doing in this world. I'm telling you folks, if you're having night dreams that don't glorify God and put you in fear and anxiety, it's time to lift up a praise. It's time to lift up your worship and let God rewrite the mental landscape of your mind so that you subconsciously think about something good before you go to bed. Does anybody out there say amen? amen? There was a fire in a computer store. And a fire department ran to the scene. And they did everything they could to try to put out this fire with no effort. They were spraying from the outside, trying to spray to the root of the fire, and it just wasn't doing much. And so they called in other fire departments, and a small fire department came in. They went over the curve and through the grass and right into the shell of the house. All the other fire departments were like, what is going on? And from within that house, they were able to combat the fire in a greater fashion. And so all the people were like, man, this is nuts. These guys are so brave. And they put the fire out. And one man was touched so much that he gave the small fire department $10,000. And so they asked the fire chief of the small department, what are you going to use the $10,000 for? And he said, well, I think we'll buy some new brakes for the fire truck. <laughs> 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 
we got it a little late, but <laughs> somebody got it over here. You see, sometimes from within the fire, we can make the most difference. When you're in trouble, when you're in difficulty, and you're in a struggle, it's your praise from within the fire that really makes the difference. Anybody can praise the Lord when things are going great, but when you have a praise during adversity and trouble and difficulties, man, I'm telling you what, it can change the atmosphere, it can change people's viewpoint of God and who he is. Man, let's praise from in the midst of the fire. Somebody bump somebody and wake them up just a little bit. Come on, bump the person next to you. I was like, was that a joke? Allison, don't hurt him. All right. You see, Joseph, his praise, his dream was birthed from within a fire. He gave praise to God what people meant for evil, God meant for good. David was chosen from the midst of the fire as he ran away from Saul, the man that he served and loved so much as an armor bearer. He ran from King Saul as he hunted his life, and God made a mighty king. Job lost his family, lost all of his wealth, lost all of his belongings, and literally was choking for lack of air for the difficulty that he was going through. But he said with my last breath, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I will praise him even if I'm robbed of everything. No one will take my praise and my worship. Amen? You see, a band of soldiers that Gideon was leading were instructed by God Almighty to win this victory in a very unique and strange fashion, a creative fashion. Today, after the service in the annual business meeting, we're going to see how creative God is. He can do some stuff that we never even dreamt of, okay? But God instructs Gideon and his soldiers, which was only 300 of these guys and tens of thousands of Midianites, he instructs them to get a pitcher, like a pitcher of water, that kind of pitcher, a torch, and a trumpet. That pitcher was going to be broken so that they heard this breaking sound, the Midianites, they would hear the Israelites break those pitchers. That pitcher, that broken pitcher, represents our broken and humble lives before God. That's the heart of worship right there. The torch represents the Holy Spirit, and the trumpet represents the praises of God. God used an ordinary man, very ordinary man in Gideon. He wants to use us. We gotta blow that trumpet of praise and worship wherever we're at, God will use it. Many of us go through valleys. I wanna say this this morning. Something is going to occupy the valleys of your life. Many times it's griping and complaining and, and feeling sorry for yourself, but something will surely occupy your valleys. Like I just said, it's easy to praise the Lord on the mountaintop, but what you do in the valley is critical. It's so important. First Samuel chapter 17 is a very familiar story of Goliath, this nine foot six man who strolls out into this valley, which was a militarily uh, strategic place for Israel. If you won this valley, you could conquer Israel. So armies would array on both sides of the valley and challenge one another. And so the Philistines had a champion who was nine foot six. This man was bad to the bone. And so Goliath went out into this valley and challenged the armies of Israel. He said, listen, I will feed the flesh of your soldiers to the birds of the air and the animals of the field. He was talking trash and trying to intimidate the armies of Israel. He occupied the valley that was so strategic in Israel's existence. Again, I want to submit to you, something is going to occupy your valley. If you feel sorry for yourself and the spirit of self-pity gets up on your shoulder and says, nobody else has gone through this, nobody's experienced this, no one treat, has been treated like this, if you get in agreement with that spirit of self-pity, the devil will jump on you so fast. We know what, what God did to those people that grumbled and complained in the desert. He just took them out. 
God isn't really high on grumbling and complaining for a place where he is with you and a place that he placed you. What's going to occupy your valley? Many times it's what fills our minds first thing in the morning and late at night are the things that are actually ruling our lives. Sure enough sign when we calm down and we settle down and there's enough peace that whatever's ruling in our heart and our mind actually begins to take over. Goliath knew this, so in the morning, he would challenge the armies of Israel. And in the evening, he would do the same. Folks, instead of listening to those voices that so many times are so loud inside of our head in the morning time or in the evening, it's time to fill our lives with the praise of God and see God put that giant down. Put those thoughts down. Put that anxiety down. Put that depression down. If you'll fill your, your mouth with the praises of God and watch the glory of heaven come down, he will be the glory and the lifter of your head. Come on, somebody. Let's praise the Lord. Let's occupy our valleys with praise. Occupy your valley with praise this morning. That's going to make the difference. Amen? That's going to make the difference. You know, David was just out there doing his job when he was tending the sheep. But we know he wrote so many songs that ended up in the Bible. And I believe why he was out there just doing the regular routine of life, the mundane activity of everydayness, he was praising God. He got those songs out there in the backside of the desert watching those sheep. And God saw his heart and said, I don't look on the outside, I look at the heart. And then he named David a man after his own heart. So David was out there, I believe with all my heart, just singing songs to God while he was doing his job. Folks, it doesn't matter if you can't sing a lick, if you can't hold a tune in a bucket. You can be out there singing your song and praising God. The Bible says that we should make melody in our hearts to the Lord. It will change and shift whatever atmosphere. If you don't like the people you're working with and they're on you all the time and they're so negative and they're so worldly, begin to praise the Lord and change the atmosphere. You don't have to say anything. You don't necessarily have to confront them. But if you lift up a song, something's coming down that they have no rule over. They have no, they have no reign over. They have no jurisdiction over. It's the presence of God. Come on, somebody. I'm a little happier than you're letting on. Come on. But you're like, Pastor Chad, I like, I don't like that praise music. I listen to country music. And to that I say, you know, I've got friends in high places. Just sing the Lord. Some old country song and put some Christian lyrics to it. There's more country people in this, verse, in this service than there was in last. Everybody looked at me like, what in the world? <laughs> Some of y'all like classical music. Cause like, how great the world. You know, that's good. If that's you, man, do it with all of your heart. Yeah. We got a lot of classical people in here. I mean, maybe you like, like quartet music. I went to a Baptist school. You know, Beulah land, I'm longing for you. No, no, no. I can listen to quartet music for a little bit, but that's some of y'all's wheelhouse, man. Get out there and Beulah land it up, son. I mean, just give it all you got, right? I came to New England, which is like the whitest place in the whole entire world. And I love soul music. So me, it's like, if you want the Lord in your life, say, oh yeah. <laughs> I told you it was white. It's okay, don't be offended. <laughs> don't be offended. But that's what I like, man. So it doesn't matter where I'm at, man, I'm gonna let it loose. I'm gonna praise the Lord. I love the acoustics in Walmart. And I noticed something. When I'm in the restroom, I have a captive audience. Nobody can move. 
So I just lay it all down on them. Jesus, take the wheel. I mean, I, I sing it all, country, classical, and when they get up, I just know that God was there, amen? Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord in this place. You see, there can be a chain reaction from what you do. Paul and Silas were in a Macedonian prison, 120 degrees in the shade, humid, no indoor plumbing, rats and rodents, chained up to the wall with their head, hands over their head. It was not a pleasant environment. And self-pity and griping and complaining and worrying and doubt could have overtaken their life. Some of you guys are chained to an experience right now. You're chained to your childhood. You're chained to a relationship. You're chained to a negative situation. And it's midnight. That's when Paul and Silas decided to do something else. Come on. I'm out of this situation. This is miry clay. This is muck. I don't want to have anything to do with the negativity of the world or the ugliness of sin. I'm going to lift up a shout to God. Paul and Silas did this in the Macedonian prison. And we had ourselves a jailhouse rock. He shook the place and set the people free. You see, you can have a chain reaction to your griping and complaining, which that usually spreads around, or you can have a chain reaction of praise. That means if you come in here and you're like Dylan up there with a the guitar, man, he's... I can't help but watch that and just want to do something. Your praise directly affects somebody seated right next to you. It's like, oh man, come on. Fire me up, somebody. Sit next to Dylan. He'll slap you right upside the face. He won't even meet it. He'll just be like, boom, boom. And, and you'll be woken up and you'll begin to praise God. Listen, there's a chain reaction that happens here. And if we all come as worshipers, man, this place will be, as Olivia said, lit. Not by the great music, but by the presence of God. God, I messed my pulpit up. I'm getting some. I don't know how I did that. Here's the thing about Paul and Silas when they praise the Lord. That jailer got set free. And his entire family. When you are free to worship God, the chain reaction will be people around you getting set free. Is anybody here believing for somebody that you know to be set free? Come on. Praise on this side of the valley. Praise and worship God and thank him for what you don't even see. I know one thing about God. That gets him fired up. When you don't even see it yet and you begin to lift up one hand without wrath and one without doubting and you begin to praise God, I can tell you the God of heaven's coming to your situation. He's coming to change your atmosphere. He's going to shift the whole environment so that he can show you that he is always showing himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is holy his. That's our God. Those that are true worshipers understand this verse, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And he has said to me, this is Jesus speaking to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. When you're down, you're depressed, and we all go through seasons, and you feel beat up, maybe you're worn out, you can't even get your face out of your bowl of Cheerios to look up and face another day. Can I tell you something? It's in those times when you feel so weak that his grace is sufficient. You lift up praise in that moment and it is birth of heaven. And he will breathe on your life and make you strong again. One of my favorite verses in all of the Bible is a section of verses in Isaiah chapter 40. Even the young man grows weary and stumbles, but those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength, they'll mount up on wings as eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Amen. Stand to your feet, church. Come on. Give God praise in this place. Amen. Thank you, God.
Come on, lift up those hands right now as a sacrifice to the Lord. Sacrifice of praise. He's good. We have a mighty weapon. We have a mighty arsenal this morning. And it's praise and it's worship. Praise and worship. Man, I tell you what. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Right at the conclusion of this service, we're going to dismiss for like five minutes and come back in. There's going to be food available that you can grab and come back to your seat. We're going to start immediately with a business meeting. I just want you to know that for members. But in this moment, I want us to just begin right now to praise the Lord without a song. Just let your voice be heard. Father, we thank you, God, that you reign in the highest heaven, Father God, and that nothing, nothing gets past your all-seeing eye. Jesus, we thank you that your hand holds the heavens in place. And surely, God, you can hold my life in this place where I find myself now. God, show me how wonderful, how big, how awesome, how loving, how intimate, how caring you are. God, we love you. We thank you that we serve such a mighty God. Come on, praise him in this place.